once you get some, get a basic idea of uh, what to see in the heart, how to make this uh, make through the chambers, you have to now apply it practically. Your practical questions will be: What is the type of shock that I'm handling, and is it a shock or not? And what are the things that we are trying to look? These are the things that we are trying to look when you do echo in a patient who mm -hmm. is in shock. Okay, so basically, what is shock? Shock is not just a falling BP, but this is something which is life threatening. A condition which affects the oxygen due to the cells. Okay, and it's very difficult that you find one fixed cause of shock. A patient might have a combination of septic or a cardiogenic shock, or might have a combination of cardiogenic with a hypovolemic shock. The different combinations will be there, and a basic echo will give you a lot of information in identifying the cause of shock. Okay, so as I summarized earlier, also cardiogenic shock you can assess with the presence of uh, whether the stroke volume is normal or not. What is the ejection fraction of the left ventricular? Whether or not there are valvular pathologies that might contribute to a cardiogenic origin of shock, and what is the diastolic dysfunction? Whether the patient the the, the extreme dilation of the chambers during the diastolic part. So stroke volume is quite validated. It is just like you have invasive cardiac output monitors. This can give you additional information, and the most validated one is the velocity time index where. We get uh, a peak velocity at just at again at the outside the purview of this lecture, but you get uh, there's a thing called the velocity time index at the aortic valve outlet where you check and see with what power the blood is being ejected out. It gives you an idea of the uh, the uh, the function of the heart and the volume status of the heart. Okay. This is the point where the LVO2 is can be measured. Left ventricle out, outflow tract. Ejection fraction, we all of us, we've seen the report, we have seen ejection fraction of 55%, 60%, and going down to 20%, 15%. So this is a good prognostic mark in chronic heart failure and also uh, tells you whether you need to give anotrophs, can you give vasopressors, how much fluid you want to give or not. These assessments and serial assessments can tell you how the heart is progressing, whether it's improving or going down. So apart from stroke volume, ejection fraction is another important parameter that we have to see. Now, if you talk about hypervolume, and this is, I think, uh, all, all of our, whoever is practicing intensive care, for them, a question is always there whether it's hypervolemic shock is there or not, whether I need to give fluid or can I give fluid to my patient. And that is where with assessment of intervascular volume is important. So in hypervolemia, there is a kissing in the ventral lobe. Okay. So if you remember this view, the best you will see in this these are the left ventricular wall. They are quite near, but not touching. If they start touching each other, each other, okay, these walls, this is called the kissing ventricular wall. Mm -hmm. If they start touching each other, that means there is no all fluid or very low fluid in the heart. That means we need to give fluids. This is the kissing ventricular wall. Okay. And then another thing is, what happens if you give too much of fluid? Then what you will see is the atrial will, will start, the septum wall will start jetting into the RA. That means the LA size is increasing. The left atrial pressure is increasing. The lung chambers are getting filled with fluid. So it not only gives you an idea that you have to give fluids, it also gives you an idea when not to give fluids. Okay. And one of the important for marker is the IVC. If you remember that view, I just told you a while back. This is the RVC, uh, IVC going into the RA. Up just around 2 to 3 centimeters from the subcostal junction, you measure this diameter. Okay. This is the IVC diameter. How we see use it? We have a formula that we use. This is the IVC. Now, if you are on if the patient is on a ventilator, the IVC will dilate with this patient. If the patient is not on a ventilator, spontaneously breathing, the IVC will collapse. Dilate in ventilator, collapse in a spontaneous breathing. Okay. Again, this is a different topic of heart lung interaction, but just for now. Can remember this. So, if this distension is more than eighteen percent, okay, that means your patient needs fluid. And SVC is the opposite. If the IVC is distending, the SVC will collapse. Okay. This is the respective deviation. Spontaneous breathing patient, as the inspiration occurs, it goes down. Okay. So it will. In positive pressure ventilation, if the patient needs fluid, it will go jet out. This is called distension. If there is no fluid necessary or there is a lot of fluid present, there will be no change in the IVC diameter. It will be totally flattened, flattened out. 
with ventilation with positive pressure but if it is jutting out that means you need the patient might do well with tubes okay so this is the collapsibility index. this was the distensibility index this was the collapsibility index and there is a formula for distensibility and collapsibility index this is the collapsibility index that the maximum diameter minus the minimum diameter of the ivc at this point this diameter so we will continue to measure it in the m mode and see the diameter maximum diameter at one and the minimum diameter depending on whether it's spontaneous free so the maximum diameter minus the minimum divided by the maximum it gives you an idea of the collapsibility index the reverse will be true in a ventilator patient maximum minus minimum divided by this is the di distensibility so this is how we do so this is at the ivc this line is cutting across for the m mode okay and this is the scc and this is the this is the scc and you see the maximum and the minimum diameter okay. this is the breathing expiration inspiration expiration inspiration and when you get these values you can calculate the distensibility and the collapsibility index mostly we use the ivc svc use rarely unless you are not able to get hold of the ivc well it's this exercise is not uh, foolproof there will be a lot of uh, pitfalls are there uh, patients uh, who are, have pulmonary embolism uh, of pericardial failure patient of chronic heart failure valvular lesion might not give an accurate image so this is a collapsible index in the inspiration and the expiration. This is cutting across the IPC. You, you try in your patients and see, uh, depending on the ventilator or the spontaneous patient, you can get these values and then apply a formula and see whether you are able to get hold of, uh, get an idea of the fluid status or not. So these are the pitfalls I said already volume overload patient, obstructive shock, high intraoperative pressures, right ventricular failure, asthmatic patients, aortic stenosis. IPC might not. Give you an accurate idea about the fluid status. Okay. Then brief about acute pulmonary embolism. Here the chambers will be dilated on the right side. The RV contraction will be affected, the pulmonary pressures will be high, and the RV will be bigger than the LV, more than half of the LV size. Again, if I go quickly back to the four chambers view. This is the RV which is less than half of the LV. If this RV starts increasing in size, okay, almost to half or more than half of the LV size, and this septum starts jutting into the LV, we can be quite sure that you have a patient with pulmonary embolism. Okay, like this. You can see this is the RV. This is the LV, which is small now. This has this is more than half the size of the LV, which has started increasing. And this gross dilatation gives you an idea that an acute pulmonary embolism has happened. Pericardial tamponade, as I said, you can see as uh, fluid around uh, the chambers, okay, and pressing the RA down. So you can see earlier when I showed you the image, there was no fluid in this area. This area was totally shiny, white like this. But you can see fluid. You can see fluid around the this and the RV in diastole is totally collapsing. This is the RV area. It's totally collapsing. It's collapsing because now this external pressure and during uh, diastole also when it should expand, it is collapsing. Then this uh, a few slides more. Okay. Uh, septic shock. Septic shock will have phases. You all know what is septic shock is a vasodilatory stage. We've all read that there is vasodilatation, but the heart can get affected in septic shock in the later stages. Uh, of infection where what we call as a, is uh, is a myocarditis or a septic myocarditis can set in okay the early phase because of the vasodilatory state the fluid will be moving out of the intravascular space so you will have a small lv kissing lv small rv everything will be small because there is no fluid inside the intravascular space everything is leaking leaky capillaries if you remember your baseline uh, uh, septic learning or septic shock okay the LVRV, the small the IVC will start collapsing. Okay, so that means they mark vasodilatation. This will be the early phase. Okay. The later stage, you can see the LV has started dilating. Okay. There will be myocardial suppression, the ejection fraction will go down because now the myocarditis has started setting. 
Why it is important the septic shock is because if we see the now the bundles they have done away with the bundles, but a lot of it is based on uh, of volume status assessment and perfusion assessment. So repeat eco exam to measure the CVP may not get a hold of uh, the dynamic assessment of fluid responsiveness with the fluid challenge, whether the IVC size is changing, velocity time index is increasing, uh, the kissing ventricles are improving, uh, the infection fraction improving. So all these things give an idea. Uh, whether your fluid dissertation is on uh, target or not. So, uh, just to end, I think, and with ample time for discussion, if you want, uh, ECO is a useful diagnostic tool, we all know. And for sepsis part, especially, uh, we, uh, we have a high accuracy in uh, uh, making out whether the patient requires fluid or does not require fluid or the fluid dissertation has gone out or not, uh, or gone overboard or not, or not. And essentially, we do no longer go for CVP measurements. Bedside eco is good enough for us, give an idea with the dynamic serial assessment for proper management of the food. If you're interested, you can read a lot of literature with uh, eco guided life support, rush that is rapid ultrasound for shock and uh, hypovolemia, uh, hypotension, sorry. And the focus uh, says trans thoracic eco fit. These are there different protocols that have been developed for in patients uh, for resuscitation with. The help of eco probes and uh, with the help of uh, lung ultrasound and all, you can combine this knowledge. A lot of resources out there if you're interested. Uh, so this is just an initiation, uh, very basic uh, knowledge. For what to learn, you have to exercise the bedside because uh, a lot of practice is required for uh, uh, in this, especially in this modality of course. Thank you.